I'm hitting, uh, I just hit record. So if you're still listening right now, or if you still have your video on right now, then I'm going to take that as you're consenting to have your, your videos um, recorded tonight and shared on YouTube. And if you don't want to be shared on YouTube, then feel free to hit the stop video down there. So your screen's not recording right now. Um, I think that's everything I really wanted to mention. Oh, other than uh, the chat room down there. So there's also a bar there that says chat. Um, so feel free to, to chat in there without the night. We have a, a good friend of mine, uh, Sherry Ann on here tonight from Blue Jay Botanicals. Uh, and she's going to be kind of moderating the chat tonight. Uh, you might have just seen Sherry Ann wave there. So if myself or our guest Scott tonight post any links or reference different websites or resources, uh, Sherry Ann will be putting those in the chat. Uh, she may also answer some questions and stuff as well. So if you see something from Sherry Ann, maybe you could just say hey in there, Sherry Ann, right now. And Sherry Ann has uh, runs two awesome organizations. I'll just tell you about right now, or, or I shouldn't say organizations, projects. One is Blue Jay Botanicals. So if you want to follow a really cool Instagram account uh, that does a lot of neat stuff around wild plants and uh, nature connection and awareness, then check out at Blue Jay Botanicals on Instagram. Uh, I suspect she'll share a little link to that. And Sherry Ann also has a podcast called the Ignite Your Wild Podcast. Uh, and she just shared her link there. So if you want to listen to a really beautiful nature connected, nature centered podcast, then uh, you can check Sherry Ann out on her podcast there, um, Ignite Your Wild as well. So with that said, everybody, thanks so much for joining us here. Um, I'll do a little bit of a, a quick intro for everybody because I know we have a bunch of new folks that haven't been on this call before. We also have some folks that are here every week. Um, so my name is Chris Gilmore and this series we call Nature Calls. And the hope is that this is kind of a, a refreshing and an educational break in our kind of crazy world that we're living in right now. Uh, I started it back in the winter when we were in the middle of a, a pretty harsh lockdown to just really bring good people together that uh, around other like-minded folks, build community, connect with the land, and also kind of have discussions and foster skills around self-reliance, uh, which I think is really important um, in the context of the, the world we're in right now, as well as stewardship, you know, how do we tend the earth in good ways? So that's kind of the overall theme. Um, so yeah, we dive into the concepts of nature awareness, self-reliance, uh, seasonal food is a big underlying theme that we chat about some weeks and then stewardship of the land. So I want to welcome you if you're here for the first time. Um, and if you're uh, a repeat person that's been on a bunch, thanks so much for coming back and joining us on this, uh, this beautiful evening tonight. So this call uh, is sponsored by my business. Uh, so I run an organization called Chris Outdoors. Uh, and if you're interested to learn a little bit about what we do in some of our offerings, you can check out chrisoutdoors.ca slash courses. And it's also brought to you by the organization that I, I run with my amazing wife uh, that she founded called Wild Muskoka Botanicals. Uh, and Wild Muskoka makes ethically wild foraged food and drink products. Uh, so an example of that would be something like this. This is our wild leek vinegar. So she takes wild leeks sustainably harvested from the woods and infuses them in apple cider vinegar. Uh, and if you go to wildmuskoka.com, um, and you enter the coupon code nature calls, all one word, you can get 10% off anything on the nature calls stores. So, uh, we run these things for free. Uh, and if you want to support our work, then the way you can do that is to check out chrisoutdoors.ca and wildmuskoka.com. And without further ado, uh, let's dive into tonight's call and introduce our guest here. Um, you'll also notice that Sherry Ann is, uh, like I'd mentioned, sharing links with the crew down there. So. Uh, I'll just do a really quick intro. Uh, our guest here tonight is Scott Miller, uh, and he's from an amazing organization called Conscious Water. Um, I met Scott, uh, geez, I don't even remember when, quite a number of years ago at a gathering we used to call called the Headwaters Gathering, which is actually part of the theme of the gathering was around raising awareness uh, about water issues. And we used to hold it in uh, a very significant Headwaters region uh, where a lot of springs were coming up into the ground and feeding a lot of the rivers that, that become the drinking water and uh, form a lot of the habitat of Southern Ontario. Um, so I met Scott years ago um, and he's a really fascinating guy. He's a, a surfer and particularly surfs on the Great Lakes, which if you know anything about surfing, that's a, a really unique kind of niche within surfing. You need to uh, have a very different relationship with the water than you might have surfing on the ocean. He's also a sailor. Uh, has had some amazing experience uh, learning and connecting with the wind and the water and the oceans um, with his sailboats. Uh, he used to be a, a canoe guide years ago, and he also runs Conscious Water Canada. So they provide clean drinking water solutions uh, through Berkey filters and do some amazing work to support uh, various organizations in, um, in trying to bring clean access to water to different communities, uh, as well as uh, ecological restoration projects around watersheds. So so that's our guest, Scott. Uh, do you want to add anything to that, Scott, or, or just say hello to our crew here? Yeah, 
Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, just wanted to say, Chris, thank you so much. I'm really grateful and, and honored for the invitation and, and to be here and, and share with everybody. So thank you. I'm excited for, for this big chat. Awesome. So our, our game plan for tonight, um, I've been playing around with the formats of these calls a little bit, and we're going to switch things up a little bit tonight for those of you that have been joining us for a while right now. Um, so I'm going to start off by a little activity, uh, and this is the one I asked you to grab a glass of water for. So if you don't have your glass of water uh, ready to go, then maybe go grab that right now, because we're going to we're going to do something with that in just a moment. Uh, so we're going to do a little activity to, to bring our minds together in a good way. Um, and I, I like to think of it as like bringing the outside in and activating our senses, even though we're in this digital world, we're still a part of nature, even in this moment. So it, it's kind of making sure our awareness knows that and our body knows that. Um, from there, we're going to do a, a little segment on, on natural awareness uh, and kind of what's going on out in nature right now. And then we're going to go into some breakout groups. And that's when you'll have an opportunity to share if you'd like to do that with some of the other folks in the group. And then after that, we'll come back and that's when we'll kind of dive into the bread and butter of the conversation with Scott tonight. Uh, and we've got some really fun topics lined up. So we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, learning about water and kind of reading the different signs of water uh, and how water interacts with other things like the moon and the weather. Uh, different different forces of nature like that, which is a fascinating conversation. Uh, hopefully there'll be some kind of practical pieces to stretch your awareness and, and think about in your weeks to come. Um, we're going to be chatting a little bit about applying some of the lessons of water to life. You know, what, what can we learn through our relationship with water and how can it um, impact other parts of our lives? And then along the, the self-reliance theme of this call, uh, we'll be chatting a little bit about clean drinking water and some of the contaminants that um, that are, are a threat to our water and some of the other forces that are a threat to our water and what we can do to secure access to clean water for ourselves. Uh, and a little bit about how we can support organizations working to bring clean water to, to other people, even here in Canada, uh, that still need it. So that's kind of where we're going with the conversation there tonight. Um, and yes, you're right there, Laura, there is water in beer. That is a true, true fact that you just shared there right now. <laughs> so uh, and no, no problem if you want to drink a, a beer while you're watching tonight. We're all adults here, so it's all good. Uh, but before you drink your beer, hold on. I'm going to ask for a glass of water without beer in it to start. Once we do this activity, then you can pull out your glass with a beer, and that's fine. So so I'd like to invite everybody for a second right now to, to close their eyes. And I'm just going to do a, a short little activity with you right now. So I'm going to invite you to hold your water in your hands and close your eyes. And we're going to be taking three sips out of the water for this exercise. So make sure you leave enough in there uh, that you can, you can have at least three sips out of it. And maybe to start things off, I'll just invite you just to kind of relax a little bit, take a couple of nice slow breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And as you do that, feel everything slowing down. Feel all the busyness of the day and whatever you're up to kind of just drifting away. Let go of any of the concerns that you have and just, just be present with this call tonight. We're here to, to feel refreshed and to be educated and to deepen our connection with the land. And just kind of let everything else go for this next hour, hour and a half or so that we're together so you can be fully present in this experience. Take one more slow, deep breath in through your nose, note through your mouth. And just feel yourself really being here right now. Remember, and we are part of nature all the time. We're in nature right now, even though we're sitting inside. I'd like to invite you right now to imagine yourself being outside by one of your favorite bodies of water. Maybe it's a little trickle of a creek through the city. Maybe it's a, a spot where you have a cottage. Maybe it's sitting out on the ocean. Uh, maybe it's in your hometown, or maybe it's a place that you had to fly on an airplane to. But just, just picture yourself by a water body that's really special to you. And take a minute to imagine what it would actually look like and feel like to be sitting in front of it right now. I invite you to fully engage your senses with this process. You know, maybe even with your eyes closed, turn your head and what would it look like if you were to kind of look around right now? What would you see? What sounds might you hear? Is the water rippling like a little creek? or their waves crashing up against the shore. Maybe you hear birds, frogs, maybe even cars, that's fine too. Just whatever you would hear in this spot that's special to you right now. Just take it all in. Maybe even take another breath in through your nose and imagine what would it smell like to be in this spot right now? What does that water body in that area smell like?
And as you're taking that all in, I invite you to really feel what it is about this spot and being by this water that just, how does it make you feel? And what is it about it that makes you feel that way? And just really connect with that body of water in this moment right now. And as you connect with that body of water, I'll invite you to, to know that water is constantly moving through a cycle. And something that I love to think about and is so fascinating that the water that I'm drinking today uh, could one day be in the ocean, or maybe it was even in the ocean. The water in my cup right now, you know, days ago, weeks ago, months ago, years ago, it could have been an aquifer kilometers or miles under the earth's surface. It could have come up through the earth's surface and potentially frozen into a glacier. It could have melted from that glacier and run down a mountain valley. It could have then evaporated up into the sky and turned into a cloud. And that cloud could have drifted the entire way across the continent into a rain. Then that water could have dropped from the cloud in the rain into the local freshwater lake right beside my house. And it could have absorbed into the ground and ended up in my well. And it could have ended up in this cup that I'm, I'm holding right now. And what's amazing is though we're all over North America right now, potentially people even from other parts of the world, uh, I like to think about water as this force that connects us all together. We all rely on it, but it's actually possible that we could have even drinking some of the same water in our lifetime in various forms as it moves around that, that system. So as you really think about the vastness of that and, and how we're all connected through water, I invite you to take your first sip of that water and really just feel it with all your senses as it goes into your mouth for your first sip of water. Really appreciate what that is and what it is for the earth, for our bodies, for the land, for all the animals that we share it with. The next thing I'd like to bring into our awareness is, is an awareness that, you know, even in this modern day and age, not everybody has access to clean water. And I think it's really important that we, we acknowledge that. Um, you know, here in Canada, there's many, many people that don't have access to drinking water. You know, often people think about that as a, a problem that's, that's far away and maybe in other countries. But even in our own country, there's people that don't have access to drinking water. There's many First Nations communities in this country who, especially in the far northern part of, of the country of Canada, whose waters have been polluted through mining and, and various activities, and they've been left to fend for themselves. Uh, governments have spoke for years and years about coming into support, and the, the action really hasn't been there. So, you know, I like to think about, you know, these communities, their ancestors have been on this land for so long. They were the original caretakers of these water bodies, and yet some of them still don't have access to clean drinking water today. Uh, and there's, there's work that needs to be done there. So with this next sip of water, I'd one like to honor the, the many first peoples of this land um, right across the, this entire place that sometimes is referred to as, as Turtle Island. And I want to acknowledge that there's work to be done. And as much as we want to hold these people in our hearts and with good intentions, there's also actions that maybe need to happen there too. So with this next sip of water, I invite us to all think about um, going forward and um, yeah, the awareness of the work that needs to be done around keeping water safe and accessible to all people. So I invite you to hold that in your thought as we take this next sip. Maybe you can think about what your part is in that story. Uh, Scott may have some ideas tonight of what your part could be if you're not sure. And last, I'll invite you to open your eyes right now. And I want to propose a toast. Uh, a toast to your health, uh, a toast to clean water, uh, a toast to nature being there to support us uh, in good times and in hard times. So cheers, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here. And we'll take this last sip to, to connect us all together, bring our minds and hearts together in a good way. Hmm. Okay, so the first part of this call tonight uh, as I said, we're going to shift this a little bit. In past calls, we've done this exercise where myself and the guest mentor have thrown out a bunch of natural mystery questions to the group, and then you've gone into breakout questions. 
how we're going to shift things this week, we'll do a little bit of experiment, and I'd love your feedback on whether you like this idea or not, um, is I'm going to share a little bit just about what I'm observing out in nature right now and what I'm doing is in relationship to tending the land, and I'm going to invite Scott to do that as well. And then we're going to split into the breakout groups and, and allow you the opportunity to do the same thing. Uh, and I think this is going to be a really fun activity because we're going to have people from all different regions and we'll be able to touch base on just like what's happening in your region out in nature right now. Uh, and I think it'll be a fun way for us to kind of track uh, the larger the our larger ecosystem and maybe have people peek things in our awareness that we just wouldn't have thought of uh, on our own. So I'll start off with mine and then I'll pass it over to Scott to share and then we're going to give you an opportunity to share if you'd like to. Sharing is completely uh, voluntary in this experience here. So for myself, um, this is such an exciting time of the year. My wife, Laura, and I live on a cool little homestead. We're up on the edge of Algonquin Park, for those that know that region of Ontario, uh, a region called Muskoka. Um, and I was actually just outside uh, pruning my grape plants and my fruit trees, uh, which was such a beautiful thing to do um, this time of year, getting ready for the gardening season. Um, and we're starting to prep soil. We're starting to prep beds. It's been really, really exciting to be working on that. We're tending all our little seedlings that are coming up under the lights. Uh, I just ordered some mushroom spawn, so we're going to be inoculating mushrooms in a couple of weeks for growing shiitakes and oysters. So that's a little bit about what we're doing on the land right now. And what I've been noticing in nature that's been really fun, I love every spring tracking the waves of birds. And it seems like every time this wind blows out of the south, a couple new species show up. So I mean, almost a month ago, the crows started showing up. And then there was this big lull, you know, not much going on. And, it, and some of you might be like, oh my goodness, we have crows and robins year round where you live. But where I live in the north, we have very few species in the wintertime. Like we mainly see chickadees and nuthatches and ravens. That's about it. And blue jays. So a couple of weeks ago, the crows came and then there was this next wave that came in. And it was like the robin showed up and the woodcock showed up and the juncos showed up. And that was about it. Um, in this last week, we had the chipping sparrows show up, which are a really, really fun one. And just yesterday was the first time I heard the Phoebe. Uh, and I love them. They wake me up every morning just before first light doing this Phoebe, Phoebe. They're kind of known to say their own name, Phoebe, Phoebe. Uh, so I started hearing the Phoebe uh, yesterday. And sure enough, probably the most exciting part of it all was the spring peepers started singing. And I suspect some of you, they've been singing for quite a while where you live, but the spring peepers, a little tree frog started singing. And what's exciting for me is somebody that's always trying to increase um, my relationship with the land and particularly uh, my ability to harvest food and water and be more self-reliant in a way that's in balance with the natural cycles. Um, one thing that the, the spring peepers tell me, um, there's kind of this ancient relationship that the spring peepers have with the, the removal of the ice and the temperatures that actually lines up with a, a species of fish called the smelts. So usually when the spring peepers start singing, the smelts actually start running. And smelts are these tiny little fish and they go and they spawn up the little creeks in mass numbers. And what's interesting, if you're not familiar with smelt, um, is they actually spawn after dark. And so what I'm, I'm probably actually going to do this after the call tonight. Uh, it's really, really fun. So we go over to these little tributaries off of the lakes and we sit there with our flashlights. And it's usually about 10, 11 o'clock at night. The spawns start coming. You'll be sitting there and it's just nothing, nothing, nothing. And you might there be there for a half an hour. And then all of a sudden you'll see two or three of these little minnows. And then within minutes, there'll be hundreds of them that just come up in a massive wave, uh, these smelts coming up. And they're coming up there to spawn. Uh, what's amazing about them, though, is uh, for myself, it's, it's part of our annual food cycle. Because we sit there with night it, with nets in the dark, uh, with headlamps on, and we'll actually net them up. And sometimes you'll get 30 to 50 uh, of these smelts in one scoop. And the, what, one thing I love about them are two things, I should say, that I love about doing smelts. One is as far as uh, toxicity, because they're such a small fish, they don't have the accumulations of like mercury and toxins that a lot of other fish have. So they're really, really healthy. Two, they're really, really delicious. But three, they're not actually a native species on the lake that I go to. Uh, they've potentially, it, it's maybe debatable, but there's some discussion around, you know, whether they've actually had a negative impact on the lake. So I can actually feel really good about scooping up hundreds of them in my net uh, and eating them because they're, they're not native species there to begin with. So it's a great local food source that's super, super nutritious. And they just happen to line up the run. That's how I kind of know when do I start going out at 10, 11 o'clock at night to look for them. Uh, it's when the spring peepers start singing. So there's a little bit about uh, myself. I know I shared quite a bit there. Um, so you don't, don't definitely don't need to share as much there, Scott, but I'll pass it over to you to share what, what are you paying attention to right now in nature, Scott? Thank you, Chris. Um... Yeah, before before that, I just wanted to yeah say thanks again for for the invitation and for having me 
in this chat. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, also, the the um, the guided meditation there you had us go through with our eyes closed was was really beautiful. So yeah, thanks for that. And it was I was I was feeling multiple places actually in in my travels and adventures of rivers and and oceans and waves and. Uh, Anyway, thank you for bringing us into that space and into a unity and community here with that. That was, that was really nice. And it reminds me of, of something I love to do before uh, guiding canoe trips when I was younger and now with family and friends is, is setting an intention before a journey and giving an offering. So we would often for a canoe trip, you know, offer some tobacco to the waters to say, to say uh, you know, thank you. May, may we have safe passage and, and this is our offering and thank you to the ancestors. So. For tonight, um, it's this is a small journey we're all on together, and to have that toast of water was was perfect. So thanks for that, brother. Yeah, it's awesome. So what am I tuning into? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm water's been my life. I'm Pisces the fish. I love being in the water and on the water and beside the water as much as possible, all aspects. So I'm I'm swimming like the water. Georgian Bay. Right? I live 200 meters from Georgian Bay in, in Collingwood, Ontario. It's beautiful. The Niagara Escarpment is only a couple kilometers away with rivers coming through the Pretty River, the Nottawasaga River, Silver Creek. So lots of water around. Uh, snow is mostly gone, but still patches melting. The rivers are raging. Just last weekend, I was canoeing some white water on the Beaver River. Um, jumped in Georgian Bay today. The water temperature is 2.5 degrees. Jumped in in my shorts with some friends and I was invigorating and felt great. Um, but the water is low. It's, it's very strange. So, I mean, we've had record highs in the past, you know, three to four years, as we all know. But uh, today where I swam, there was these um, slab, limestone slabs that I hadn't seen for years. And the water is very low, although the rivers are raging and with the snow melt and we've had some rains, the, the, the Georgian Bay level is quite low. So it just gives me a curiosity to, to research that. And I'm gonna look into that, what's happening and, and why is it that low? Um, so that's, the, yeah, that was the main one for me today. Awesome, thanks Scott. So what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna take about 10 minutes and I'm gonna invite you to join a breakout room and I'm gonna pose kind of two questions for you. Um, one of them is just, what are you not noticing out in nature right now around you? You know, it could be about the birds, it could be about the stars, it could be about water. Uh, what, what's kind of capturing your attention and your excitement and your curiosity uh, in your local ecosystem right now? Um, and two, is there, do you have a mystery question right now? You know, kind of like Scott just posed there. He's like, what's going on with the water right now? I'm curious about that. So if there is a, a, a naturalist mystery question that's piquing your attention that you're wanting to, to solve, maybe it's like, hey, I heard this bird call today. I didn't know what it was. Uh, does anyone know what it, it was? It sounds like this, Phoebe, Phoebe. Uh, so you could pose that to the group. Uh, the other thing I'll just share with this too is just a, an invite for two things. One, to make sure that you know I'm going to invite you just to make sure you're aware of how many people are in your group and what the timeline is and that everybody has an opportunity to share. Um, so just please be aware of how much space and time you're kind of taking up. Um, two, I'm going to share that, you know, don't feel any intimidation about your level of knowledge. Um, if you're a total beginner and new to this, uh, feel free just to listen or just to say, I, I don't really have a clue. You know, I don't really actually think about this stuff. Um, you're, you're, you're totally welcome to be in there and engage regardless of where you're at in your journey. Uh, tonight. You can go in, be a fly on the wall and just listen. You can share a little or you can share a little bit more. So all of those are, are free. And I just ask that everyone be super respectful of everybody being at different parts in their journey and, and where they're at and of that time. Uh, from a logistical perspective, in a moment, you'll see a screen pop up and you'll be invited to join a room. Um, once you uh, join the room there, just know if there's any problems inside of there. I think there's a, a setting where you can kind of ask for help. So I can pop in there if you're having an issue. Um, but number two, just know if you end up in a room and there's only like one person in there or, or something's weird, I'll actually be spending the next couple of minutes jumping around and kind of reorganizing the rooms to try and get an even amount. So if you're in a room by yourself, just hang tight um, and I'll make sure that I get some more people in with you. It's sometimes a little bit glitchy, but I'm usually able to fix stuff pretty quickly. Um, if you do not want to join the rooms at all, then you've got 10 minutes to take a, a quick break right now. So I'm going to... Uh, start the rooms and we should have everybody back from the breakout rooms. I remembered to hit record. Uh, someone in the crowd reminded me last week I forgot to hit record, so I, I missed some of it. Um, I should just mention, if you weren't uh, part of last week's call, we had a really special guest on last week, uh, just a really awesome opportunity. This uh, girl, Sunshine Claymore, 
um, who's from Standing Rock, who became kind of famous a few years ago, the region, uh, when they had all of the, the protests related to the pipelines there. Uh, and she had some beautiful stories sharing about the traditional food forests and how they're doing this big restoration project to, to kind of restore some of the, the land that's been damaged by the, uh, the dams and stuff that have been built there. Um, so all the replays of all the past ones, including the ones we did in the winter, uh, are all available um, inside of our, our YouTube channel there. So you can go back and watch any of them. So anyways, if you didn't watch last week with Sunshine, it was a really, really great one there. So, all right. Well, thanks and welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're just going to take a, a quick break here, or not a break, sorry, I'm just going to do take a quick little segment here to uh, let you know about a couple of other upcoming opportunities. And then we're going to dive into kind of the, the main part of tonight, which is chatting with Scott all about lessons from water and water ecology, um, and ways that we at home can make sure that we have clean drinking water, uh, and what we maybe even do in an emergency or disaster or something threatens our, our water. So those are the topics that we're going to dive into shortly here. Um, but as I said, yeah, I'd like to let you know about a couple of opportunities. Uh, if you'd like to go deeper with your nature connection journey, uh, if you want to expand, if one of your goals is to actually become more self-reliant in 2021, uh, then these may be of interest to you. So first off, we have, uh, these calls are going right through the rest of April and May. Uh, next week, we have an amazing lady, Brandy Gallagher, um, from our eco village uh, out on the west coast of Canada. Uh, she's a, a fascinating lady. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff related to permaculture. Um, and, and community and relationships. Um, so that's coming up. And then the week after that, we have an amazing gentleman named Dan Gardoki, uh, who's a real expert in bird language and wildlife tracking. So we'll be diving into the realms of what are the birds saying, uh, as well as reading, interpreting the signs of nature. So those are two upcoming things here. Those are both free, the Nature Calls one. Two paid opportunities I have up if you want to go deeper in skills right now. Uh, I run a course, uh, it's, I'm actually creating a course right now on how to grow your own edible mushrooms. Uh, one of my favorite crops to grow each year is our shiitake mushrooms. Uh, and they, their first flush usually happens to come up with our asparagus in the springtime. Uh, it's, it's, once you put in the initial work, it's amazing because these logs will produce for anywhere from six to eight years uh, with very little work after the initial uh, input. So I'm making a course all on how to grow your own mushrooms. And I've decided to actually uh, release it in two parts to kind of help fund the creation of the course. So the first half on growing logs is actually already up right now. And if you go to chrisoutdoors.ca slash courses, um, you can get access to it for only $24.99. It's basically half price right now. Um, and I'm, what I'm going to be doing is basically filming a whole bunch more and adding the second half of the course over the rest of the summer, where we get into other techniques outside of growing on logs, um, even growing indoors and containers and things of that nature. And we're going to get a little bit into even wild foraging mushrooms and ecology. Um, so it's the Grow Your Own Mushrooms course at Chris Outdoors, and it's basically half price right now um, because of the way that we're kind of launching it in two parts. So if that interests you, there's one opportunity. Uh, another opportunity is with a, a gentleman that some of you may know if you were part of the winter series, Caleb Musgrave. Uh, I'm actually wearing the shirt for his organization right there, Canadian Bushcraft. Um, Caleb is an absolute wealth of knowledge. Um, he's Nishnabe from Hiawatha First Nation, uh, and he was brought up on the land uh, hunting and foraging and working traditional skills. Uh, and as I said, just an absolute wealth of knowledge, a really, really fantastic gentleman. And I have the, the fortune and privilege to have gotten to know him very well. And we've realized that, you know, a lot of people don't have mentors to help them uh, bring up in these skills. And we're going to be running a very special course that we're calling the Hunter's Journey. And I know for some people, they might have mixed feelings about this topic. Um, but the, his people have been in relationship with harvesting meat from this land for, for tens of thousands of years. Um, and it's been a big part of my life journey and actually my relationship with the land. So if you're interested in exploring the idea of what would it maybe look like to harvest food from the land in a sustainable and an ethical way, um, we're going to be running this, this course starting this May called The Hunter's Journey. Um, and there's more information of that over at chrisoutdoors.ca slash courses as well. Um, that course is going to be starting May 9th. There's just a waiting list up there right now you can, you can sign up for, and we'll be releasing kind of all the details around that soon. Of course, you can email me at chrisoutdoors.ca if you've got any questions. And then the last thing that I'll mention before we, we dive in here tonight. Oh, nice. I just saw there Sherry Ann shared the, the link for um, Dan with Lead with Nature if you want to check him out. Uh, and she also shared the link to Caleb's podcast. Caleb has an awesome podcast called the Canadian Bushcraft Podcast. So if you're a podcast person, uh, you might want to check out a bunch of his free content over there as well. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to mention is just do one more quick shout out for uh, Wild Muskoka Botanicals. Uh, this is the organization my wife runs, uh, making ethically sourced uh, or ethically harvested wild foods. 
So I mentioned soon uh, the wild leeks are just starting to pop here uh, and we make multiple products out of wild leeks, like the wild leek vinegar and our wild salt. And one of my favorite is actually our bitters. Uh, bitters used for digestion uh, and can be also used to make beautiful cocktails. And being that our theme's water tonight, what I love doing is I'll take some water and I'll put it in the soda stream and sparkle it up. And then I'll take a dropper full of the bitters, drop it in there, and it's a nice healthy drink instead of having a pop or instead of drinking alcohol, but it still gives you that light bubbly taste. So if you go to wildmuskoka.com and you enter the, the coupon code nature calls, then you get 10% off anything from the, the Wild Muskoka store there. And without further ado, why don't we bring Scott back on? Scott, you ready to, uh, to dive into to the main topic for tonight's call? Where are you, Scott? I don't see you on my screen. Sorry, I was, I was muted there. Yeah, I'm here, good to go. Awesome, welcome in. All right. So as I said, there's a few topics that I want to dive into tonight. And I think I'm hoping this piece will be, you know, a mixture of inspiration, uh, as well as some kind of practical things to kind of stretch your awareness and thinking about how water interacts with different things and our relationship with water. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and then we're also going to just talk about uh, practicality of uh, clean drinking water and maybe a little bit about water in emergencies and uh, what are some things we can put in place there. Scott's also going to share about some of the organizations he support that are working on access to clean drinking water here in Canada. Um, but maybe, you know what I'd love to start with, Scott, when we were chatting on the phone prepping for this call the other day, uh, you were telling me about a quote that, uh, or I don't know if it was a quote, but you told me about a moment, something someone said to you that really influenced your life. Um, and I think it had something to do with, so you were on a canoe trip um, back in the woods and somebody had mentioned that, you know, after a week, or maybe I'm getting the timer off there, your body becomes a certain percentage of the actual river that you're drinking out of. So literally you're drinking water out of that, that river all week. And I think, I forget what it is, but isn't our water, our bodies are something like 70% water. So if you think about it, after a week of drinking that water, a percentage of your body is literally made up of that river uh, that you're, you're traveling down. Uh, so maybe we could start there and you, you could just tell us a little bit about that, that moment and how that really shifted your relationship and perspective on water. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Big moment. I, I was 16 years old. Um, just about to start a month long river canoe trip on the Missinabi River, which flows from just north of Lake Superior into James Bay, an Arctic watershed. And uh, yeah, the, the guides, we were just, just leaving the Headwaters Lake, about to enter the river, and we rafted up the canoes and, and we gave our, our tobacco, our offering. And then one of the guides explained to us um, after a week, you know, we're going to be drinking this river water daily. And after a week, uh, all the water in our bodies will be renewed and you will physically be 60 to 70% this river that we're traveling on. And it, it yeah, it, it, that really hit home for me in the moment. And then I've, I've been on a couple of week or two week trips before and since, and it always feels about that, you know, six to seven day period where you start to feel just very in tune and connected with with your environment and with the water you're traveling on. And I think part of that is because you're actually embodying that body of water you're traveling on. Yeah, beautiful. You know, it's interesting. I, I had never actually really thought about this until our conversation the other day. So I used to guide wilderness canoe trips for, for years too. I think I did it about six years. And I loved it when we did trips that were four days or longer, because it was about four or five days in, like something shifted in me, like in a really big, deep oh, way. And, with, and something shifted 100%. in people. And, you know, I had always taken it to just like, you know, it takes a few days for our minds to turn off from all the stimulus that we're used to and the busyness and the to-do list. And after three, four days, you know, we start to, we just start to let go. Uh, but I never actually really thought about, well, what impact is actually drinking that water having on us as well? And I'm, I'm sure there's, there's something happening there on a physical level, uh, on a psychological level, on a spiritual level, even there connecting with that water body over time. But I noticed a really visible shift in my awareness uh, and just who I was and how I carried myself um, kind of going in four or five, six days beyond there. So um, anyways, that just, that just kind of inspired me when you were saying that, Scott, and made me kind of add another layer to that, that piece there. Yeah. Yeah, I love that part too. And I, I mean, it's on my it's on my website. I share that in like who I am, and it's part of how my my business started. And and also, I think a part of that too is when you're out on trip, you know, you're barefoot a lot, you're swimming a lot, you're you start living with the sunrise and the sunset. You're just getting more and more in tune with the natural rhythms of of the world. And it's 
you know, after, yeah, that five to seven day period, you really tune in and, and ground and, and feel it. And then every, just life is, is better and you feel like oh, well, I'm at home and in this forest and on this river, it's, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Um, so let, let's chat surfing a little bit. And I, I think this is a really fun topic, even for, you know, I'm, I can't imagine there's anyone on here. If you haven't been surfing before, you gotta, you must've at least dreamed of being on a surfboard at some point <laughs> in your life. Uh, it, it's, um, I, I'm definitely not a skilled surfer, nothing like Scott, but I, I've been a handful of times uh, on the West coast of Canada. Uh, I also was able to surf down in Costa Rica two, two years ago. And it's a really special way to relate to the water beyond it being like an adventure sport or an extreme sport. I mean, that's not actually the part that calls to me. It's, it's actually, you know, I've always found the ocean a little bit intimidating uh, and even really rough water intimidating, you know, and, and just because it has such sheer force and power. And for me being out there on the surf part, it was actually this new way to relate to that kind of ebb and flow and the power of the water. Um, so maybe, um, you know, actually, before I even ask this question, I'm going to just throw another one in here. You know, what, what is it that draws you to surfing? What, what is that experience about for you, Scott? Yeah, great question. And you're just going to have to stop me anytime because I can talk for hours about surfing. Um, and, and I do often with my friends. It's great. Um, and before I answer, though, I just wanted to think back quickly to the, the little breakout groups there we had. That was really, really great. And it reminded me of something I just wanted to say to everybody is, whatever comes up in this next hour or so we're talking. Um, uh, I love talking water and learning and sharing with everybody. So if anything comes up and you want to continue the conversation, uh, please reach out to me, uh, email me or call me or through social media. Anyway, um, I just had a really great sharing of some cold water swimming ideas with a woman named Roberta in my group. And it uh, just reminded me like this, yeah, this is beautiful. Everyone here is passionate about nature, and exploring and adventure and self-sufficiency and and i, I want to I'm, I'm open to continuing the conversation whatever might come up for anybody um surfing so yeah, what drew to me originally was just um being a water lover i'm, I'm pisces the fish all my life has just been drawn to the water even in grade six and seven science projects were about water I love sitting by it, swimming in it. I was a lifeguard, a commute trip guide, learned to sail, uh, just, yeah, everything water. And, and then the next step really was learning to surf. I was like, what is the most intense experience and in tune I could be with the water is riding a wave. So I, I learned, I, I learned late in life. I was uh, 25 when I first started. Most people are a lot younger, but you can learn anytime. I know 60 year olds that have started. Um, so it's, yeah, kind of like you said, it's, it's the unity, it's the magic and beauty of it. And, and when you think about what is a wave, a wave is just an energy, it's a frequency, it's a pulse of energy that's been traveling through the ocean for maybe three, 4,000 miles or through Georgian Bay for two or 300 kilometers. So it's just, it's a frequency of pulse of energy that once you're in tune with, once you can read that frequency and pulse, and then once you're, you have that awareness and you have that fitness and you have the hours and, and time and experience out there, you, you notice the subtleties and you can see the wave coming from afar and you get yourself in the right place. And, and then when you catch the wave, you're, it's, it's beautiful in so many ways. It's a meditation. It's, it's exciting. It's a rush. And then, but it's also such an in-tuneness with the universe. Uh, there's just so many factors that have to come together for, for a perfect wave. And when it all does, and then you can see it happening and you put yourself in the right time and you paddle like crazy to catch that wave. And then you're riding it. And it's just, it's undescribable. It's, it's, you, you, you're not thinking, you're just feeling, you're moving with that wave and that frequency and pulse. And it's, uh, yeah, so that's what drew it. That's what drew me to it. And, and once I caught my first waves and, um, you just can't stop like Kelly Slater, one of the world's best surfers said, you know, it's, it's like the mafia, you know, once you're in you're you can't get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. You know what really impressed me once, uh, and th this was actually a big shift for myself and even thinking about relationship with water, but I remember being down in Mexico with my wife in my early 20s, um, and we were on this beach where they were actually advising people not to swim because it was known for having a really strong rip current, and I was just terrified yeah. of the idea of being pulling yeah. out. 
And there was this surfer there from California and he literally swam without a life jacket into the rip current on purpose. And he let it pull him yeah. way out to sea. And he literally just followed it all the way around. And then he swam back in. Yeah. And I, yeah. without a life jacket by himself, he didn't tell anyone he was doing it. I just watched him do this over the course of like 45 minutes. And I was terrified to even go in the water. They had no swimming things. And it was beautiful to see this guy get in there. And he just had this relationship that allowed him to interact it, with it in such a different way than I knew how to do, you know? And um, it's, it's one of the reasons I love teaching nature mentoring and skills. Cause I know a lot of people have fears and barriers, even about say going into bear country or wolf country. And, and, you know, I, I interact with those animals on a somewhat frequent basis with, with little fear because we have a relationship and we know how to do that dance, you know? Um, right, yeah. So something you referenced there, Scott, you know, was the, the different things coming together to make a wave. And I think this could be fascinating even for folks that aren't surfers or maybe never would surf, but I know, you know, oceans, you know, um, there's, there's tides and there's the moon, but you've also got this massive body and the, the topography and it often creates pretty consistent breaks. But my understanding is the Great Lakes work quite differently. Uh, and there's a fair bit to actually kind of read, like there's a relationship and maybe it's some of the same elements, maybe you'll correct me, but between like the moon and, and different things. So from a, a naturalist and ecology perspective, you know, what are some of the different elements that come together on the, the Great Lakes? And, and what are you watching for to actually know when it's going to produce the kind of wave that you need to surf? Because I, I don't, from my understanding, you can't just go and surf any wave on the Great Lakes. You're, you're waiting for some very specific things to come together. So how, how do naturalist skills and knowledge of ecology and even the weather and awareness play into uh, you knowing when there's going to be a break to go surf? Yeah, great question. And um, I can do a, if, if I can do a quick uh, comparison between ocean and, and lake surfing too, if, if you want. Um, I'll start with lake surfing, of course. So uh, lake surfing, it's a very different, it's a very different beast. So lake surfing, uh, you're surfing during the storm, basically. So we're, we're watching weather, we're watching for weather patterns. So here on Georgia Bay, we're looking for northwest winds of 20 to 30 knots for at least six hours. If we get that, and where I live here in Collingwood, we're no, we'll know we'll have some good waves. So you can look at charts and weather patterns. There's a lot of apps you can watch um, that talk about wind. Um, so Northwest, West is what we want here, but here it's interesting because like Georgian Bay from the, from Killarney to Wasaga beach is about 200 kilometers. Um, so we, we, we are, we're surfing during the storm. So when we're out there surfing, it's, it's very windy. It can be hailing sideways. Sometimes, you know, we're surfing in January. Um, but as opposed to the ocean, the the waves are generated maybe 3,000 miles away in a hurricane or a typhoon or a tropical storm. Um, so when you're in the ocean, often when the waves arrive, they're arriving a week after the storm. Whereas when we're surfing on the Great Lakes in Georgian Bay, we're surfing during the storm. So it's often much messier, um, much more intense. You know, it's yeah, it's windy, it's hailing, it's snowing, and then it's so variable too. You know, one minute it's hailing, one minute it, then it's sunny, and then we see a rainbow. I was surf a couple of weeks ago. I saw a couple of swans fly by as I was out there. It was it was really beautiful. Um, and what makes what makes for a good wave is is wind. So it's the same on the ocean and the lake. So you need sustained winds um for a certain amount of time and then once those waves arrive at the beach or the reef uh the bathymetry is the underwater landscape uh the underwater topography so then you need the right bathymetry which would be you know like a gradually rising beach or maybe a steeper reef or slab rock um so then you need in the ocean, you need yeah, the moon to be in the right cycle, uh, like full moons make for larger tide discrepancies, higher and lower. And then some, some waves in the ocean, you can only surf on a high tide, some only on a low tide. You need the, the swell direction to be in the right direction. Um, you know how that works, the, the moon cycle there as far with the tides, like what actually happens there? I'm fascinated by how many different subtle cycles the moon impacts here on earth, you know, and Biodynamic yeah. gardeners talk about it with growing food, and I know it impacts, you know, the behavior of wolves and deer uh, and things like that. And That's us. something I've tracked. And, 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 and us, yeah. Yeah. So and, what, what, yeah, what, what's actually going on between the moon and the water there? Do you, do you understand that a little bit? Or? 
Uh, I, I couldn't describe it to you like with, with physics, but basically when, when, when the moon is full, it's more powerful. So the ebb and the flow of the tide is, is, is stronger. So yeah, a full moon makes for higher tides and also, and also lower. So, and then sometimes you like on a blue moon, you have uh, an even higher tide uh, for some reason. So um, yeah, it's, it's when, when the moon is new, the tides are, you know, maybe may ranging like five feet and depending where you are in the world. And then when it's a full moon, they could be ranging six or seven feet. So like I was saying, some breaks in the world, you can only surf on a high tide or a low tide. Some breaks are better when it's an incoming tide, some are better on an outgoing tide. And then typically in Central America or Mexico, for example, with the winds, um, you want with offshore wind, say this is the wave uh, and this is the land. And in the morning, you have the wind coming offshore because the ocean is warmer than the land. So that kind of, the wind is coming offshore, the, the wave is coming in and breaking and the wind actually holds up the face of the wave and makes it steeper and cleaner. Oh, cool. So that's a better wave. And then mid midday, the land is much hotter uh, than the ocean. So then, then it's an onshore wind. The wind is rushed, the, the cold air is rushing off the water onto the land and rising and then when it's so this is the wave again the wind coming behind it and then it kind of smushes it down and flattens it it makes it like mushy mashed potatoes we call it and uh that's that's not good so usually that's one of the reasons sunrise and sunset surfing is often better on the ocean i love that stuff it's so fascinating I don't know if we have time to get into it because I know I have a bunch more questions, but I'd, I'd imagine there's a bunch of cool, similar naturalist stuff that come up as a, as a sailor too, when you're out in the boat that you're watching, you know? Um, I'll, I'll yeah, just mention something yeah. if folks, sorry, I'll, I'll pass it over to you in just a second, but if folks haven't ever checked it out a number of years ago, and, and uh, for the Americans in the crowd here tonight are places from other parts of the world, uh, here in Canada, we have this radio station called CBC, and every year they do this series called the Massey Hall Lectures. Um, so if you're familiar with those, uh, it's quite a few years ago, there was a guy named Wade Davis that came on and he did a, a series called The Wayfinders. And if you haven't checked it out, just, just search. And he has a book called The Wayfinders as well. So search Wade Davis, Wayfinders, uh, way with the W. Uh, and one of the, the episodes in there, he talks about the early Polynesian uh, travelers that basically had very limited technology. You know, they didn't have famous or fancy maps and compasses but they were actually able to rely on their in-depth knowledge and relationship with the land to actually travel way further offshore and out on the oceans than a lot of kind of, what do you call like modern sailors, you know, like the Spanish and the English, you know, uh, he, he basically makes the case that these kind of primitive um, sailors had way better skills at water than a lot of people with these modern technologies based on the relationship of the land and, you know, knowing how big, Oh, I just saw Roberta holding up the book there, you know, talking about like knowing how far different birds fly off or noticing the pattern of the ripples as they break off the bow of the boat to know where land is, even though you can't see it. Uh, it's a phenomenal book about the potential of human relationship with the land and the water. So I, I don't want to go on a huge tangent there, Scott, but I don't, I don't know if you want to, if you have a quick sailing story or anything that, that comes to mind or is inspired by what, what I just shared there in, in your sailing stories. Yeah. I've read and heard the same thing. It's incredible. I mean, they, they could even just dip their finger into the water and taste it and, and, and different salinities, different currents and see like, oh, are we on track or not? And it's incredible when you look at the, the maps there, you know, they're shooting for islands that are, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away. And if they miss it, they're just heading for another thousand miles and maybe, you know, they're going to run out of food or whatever. Like it's, it's unreal to me how people were navigating back then without sextants and compass and everything else. Um, yeah, great point. So two things come to mind there for me, we just wear water sports, uh, the crossover of, of traveling on water. So a lot of my uh, life, yeah, has been like how to safely travel on water. So in a canoe, in a kayak, in a sailboat, on a surfboard, swimming, whatever. Um, so a couple times that uh, two things come to mind. Yeah, one with canoe tripping on rivers and just understanding how to move a boat safely through a river. Uh, and then uh, with surfing, uh, both times crossed over onto sailing, which really kind of gave me confidence and kind of, uh, I think maybe saved me from disaster perhaps a couple of times. Uh, one was I sailed across the Atlantic Ocean in 2008 on a 90 foot sailboat uh, with some sailors I met in Panama. We ended up sailing to Europe 
And uh, we got into some big swell there between Bermuda and the Azores, it was a 10 day crossing. We had a following sea. Uh, yeah, the yacht I was on was 90 feet, 120 foot mast, beautiful sailboat. And we got into some big, not, not, not a storm, but just some big rolling swell. But it was rolling so big and high that the, the, I, the boat was surfing. So when we, when we would catch, when the stern would rise, we would just shoot down the, the wave. And, um, and it's a 90 foot, you know, like 40 ton yacht. It's, and so if you'd surf the wave wrong, you know, you could dig the nose and you'd have a huge amount of water just pouring over everything, perhaps coming into the cockpit. So because I knew how to surf already, I could feel the same kind of sensation um, of the rise and, and the glide. So instead of digging the nose, I could, you know, turn the wheel a couple times and just surf sideways down the wave. So it was like a consistent, like five or six hours of surfing this 90 foot boat uh, down on some waves it was amazing. Whereas if I didn't know how to surf, I don't think I could have navigated that, that swell or that issue at the time. And then another was um, coming into Little Current uh, Man between Man Manitoulin Island and the mainland there up at the northwest end of Georgian Bay. And it was not a little current that day. It was about four, four knots of current. And um, it's basically a lot of, it's a narrows. And when you get a big west or northwest wind blowing through, it creates almost like a river situation. And I was coming through and I needed to dock my, I had a 30 foot sailboard at the time and I needed to dock it. And um, it was basically like navigating a sailboat in a river, uh, like swifts almost, little standing waves. And, and you know, if I had just turned the boat hard like I usually would to dock it, it would have just been swept away and crashed. But because I could see the current and I understood from canoe tripping, you need to just make a slight angle of the bow and then use the current to your advantage and just kind of slowly ferry across sideways, then I was able to, to dock the boat safely and avoid a crash. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love, I just love that. I love the, the intricacies of of reading water, of, of being able to like look ahead and see what's happening and, and know how to keep myself and my family or friends safe on whatever vessel I'm on at the time. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I just love the relationship component of it. You know, um, this is some of you that know me fairly well know that, you know, one of the things I've done a lot the last kind of 15 years, a big part of my life has been around wilderness survival and, and teaching wilderness survival skills and these living skills. But for me, it's not so much about like, what do you do in the zombie apocalypse or whatever. It's actually the, the relationship that you build with the elements and with the land through practicing these things, uh, which then actually become relevant if you end up in a scenario. So it's beautiful that you had these, these stories from surfing and how it potentially saved you uh, when you're out on, the, on these big waters in the sailboat. Um, you know, I feel like this yeah. is how humans have related to the land for, uh, you know, hun literally hundreds of thousands of years. And it's so beautiful and empowering uh, when we start reclaiming some of these pieces inside of ourselves, the, the ability to, uh, instead of being afraid of the elements, uh, to actually have a relationship with them and know how to, to work with them and do that dance. So uh, beautiful stories there, yeah. Scott. Thanks so much for sharing. Exactly. Yeah, you're welcome. And exactly. Yeah, it's, it's the dance. It's, I love that expression, the, the dance. That's, that's, that nails it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I think where it would be really nice to go next, let, let's dive into the realm of, of water, uh, of drinking water for a little bit. That's another uh, big part of what you do. Um, I think I said this at the beginning, but Scott runs it. He's the Canadian distributor for Berkey water filters. So a type of water filtration system. Um, so Scott's also fairly versed in, in the realm of uh, water issues. Um, so maybe, maybe a question to start us off here would be, uh, thinking about drinking water right now, there's, I hear all these kind of things in the news these days about, you know, petrochemicals and uh, microplastics and how even some of the water in, whether it's municipal water or even bottled water in the store um, are starting to become more and more contaminated with these different things. So uh, maybe, maybe we could start off with like the problem um, and then transition towards different, different options around um, whether it's treating water or whether it's healing the actual ecosystems where the waters come from. But, but let's start there. You know, what, what are some of the things that are on your radar as, as far as kind of water issues or challenges that we're facing right now, Scott? Yes, great question. And a lot of my um, inspiration and motivation with my business 
of selling uh, of selling Berkey water filters is comes from my cu customers and just you know I'm I'm on I'm on emails and phone calls daily with a lot of people and and then there's certain ebbs and flows and surges of questions and issues of what's happening. Uh, so the two main concerns I've I've been feeling the past couple of years is 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 twofold uh, fluoride and pharmaceuticals in the water. Excuse me. So um, fluoride is, as we know, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's in some, it's added to some tap water. It's not everywhere. Like in Collingwood, for example, where I live, there, there's no fluoride added to the water. In Toronto, there is. Uh, the fluoride they do add to the water is, is called hexafluorosilicic acid. And it's a byproduct of the phosphate fertilizer industry. Um, and yeah, if, if you believe, you know, if some people that they're, some doctors or the professionals believe it's good for your teeth, then sure use a fluoride uh, mouthwash or toothpaste, but why drink it, right? So there's more and more Canadians are, are learning how fluoride is toxic and they're rising up and, and talking to their, their town council and saying, you know, I, we don't want fluoride in the water anymore. So for example, Calgary, Alberta, about 10 years ago, they stopped water fluoridation. More and more communities across Canada are stopping water fluoridation. Um, so that's uh, an issue. And then pharmaceuticals, um, they, you know, in the Great Lakes systems, for example, um, the, the wastewater treatment plants are not removing pharmaceuticals from the water. And then also the, the fresh water, the drinking water facilities are also not. And there's so many people these days on antidepressants and birth control pills. So the, the amount of, and just, just different medicines, so the amount of pharmaceuticals in the Great Lakes system is slowly rising. It's still in the parts per billion level, but it's a, it's a concern. It's a growing concern for people. Um, so the, the product I sell, the Berkey water filters, um, yeah, targets both of these issues. It can remove fluoride and uh, many pharmaceuticals. Do you know much about the other one that I've been hearing a lot about is uh, is the idea of microplastics and like plastics starting to break down? Uh, do you know much about yeah. that? And do you know do municipal systems would they would they filter out the microplastics or do you think some of that stuff's getting through our, our municipal systems? Um, I know there's a big issue amongst like kind of biologists and stuff right now about the impact of microplastics on wildlife and particularly uh, well really all wildlife because all wildlife are, are drinking uh, our wild waters, but also the ones that are living in it. Do you know much about that and, and how that relates to kind of municipal water? I don't know a lot about it. No, I, I, I don't know if the water treatment plants are, are removing that or not. Um, I do know, I just saw recently from a friend's, uh, actually from a surfer's group chat I'm in locally, um, some, they're, 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 there's a lot of, they're studying it now in the uh, elementary and high schools. And there are also, there's a company offering a uh, certain filter you can attach to your washing machine now, which um, will remove microplastics because a lot of our, you know, the, there's plastics in our clothing and in our towels and things. And, and then those microplastics get out through the washing machine into the, into the wastewater. So there's actual filters now that you can attach to your washing machine that will collect those. And it's part of an ongoing study of, you know, how much plastic is coming off of our clothes and, and going into the water. Um, another person I recommend following about this if you're on if you're on Facebook or Instagram or you just Google his name is Scott Parent and he lives on the Bruce Peninsula again that's Scott Parent and uh, he and his daughter had done a stand-up paddle trip around Lake Huron and Georgian Bay I think two summers ago and they were collecting uh, samples of microplastics uh, as they went and they're huge advocates about this so I would I would look him up and uh he could direct you to more information about that. Sweet, I, I just wrote down that name, so I'll definitely check that out. Um, yeah. yeah, cool, those are all good things to be kind of thinking about. It's interesting, so my relationship with kind of water filtration started as a canoe guide um, when we were tripping in areas where we couldn't, um, um, yeah, where we were worried about different things in the water. Um, and then it kind of moved into the realm of, of wilderness survival. And it's like, okay, I'm lost in the woods now, how do I, how do I purify water? And in more recent years, in my work more in emergency and disaster preparedness, thinking about climate change, thinking about emergencies, now it's, it's kind of taken on this whole new level. Because in the wilderness, um, from my understanding, you know, the main things that we need to worry about in a wilderness setting is bacteria in the water, right? And maybe sediment. So, yeah. So, like, if you're, you're maybe in the beaver pond there, and one thing is just, like, all the muck and stuff. And, you know, it's maybe not necessarily bad to drink it. It's just it's not going to taste well, and it's maybe not going to digest well. 
But then the second component is, okay, what if there is animal feces? What if there is a coli? What if there's other bacteria? Uh, so wilderness context, that's relatively easy. I mean, we can send it through a filter, like literally in, uh, you can get a coffee filter, pour the water through the coffee filter, and then put it over the fire, bring it to a rolling boil, it kills all the bacteria, you're good to go. Um, right. In the context of emergency and disasters, though, we have this third element, um, and really maybe a fourth and fifth. Um, so one of them would be viruses. Um, another one would be things like cysts. And then the, the third one would maybe be that everything that falls into that realm of, of chemicals. So that's kind of what I think about with water filtration. So if we want to bring this more to like an urban context or disaster context, am I kind of covering the gambit of things we want to think about being able to take out and purify? Definitely. Yeah. And I would add to the list of uh, parasites, um, you know, Jardia beaver fever. So I, I got beaver fever also called Jardia uh, twice. That was the inspiration for me to start my business conscious water um, and just getting more conscious and aware of, of wanting to drink good water and not get sick again. Um, so I would add to the list, yeah, parasites for in the canoe tripping realm and cottagers and hunting and fishing camps, for example. Um, and then also heavy metals and pesticides mm -hmm. and herbicides like gly glyphosate, for example, uh, is, uh, is in Roundup. It's used on farmer's fields. It's getting into people's wells. Heavy metals, of course, um, agriculturally, but industrially are out there as well. So those are also concerns. Interesting. Uh, I'm going I'm to pop over to a question that just came in the chat. I kind of answered this a second ago, but I'm just going to uh, answer it again. Yeah. Uh, and maybe you want to add your system for it. Um, so Laura um, just asked the question there. What do you do? What do you do about drinking water in the wilderness? So I'll give kind of like, my, I, I've got three answers for that. And then I wonder if you'll add anything different to it, Scott. Um, sure, so yeah. one in certain bodies, depending on where I am. And, you know, this is a personal decision and I'm not necessarily recommending this, but there's, there's certain places where I feel the water is, is so pure and clean um, I'll actually just paddle out in the middle of the lake and just drink the water. Um, for me, that's usually when we're moving north of Algonquin Park uh, and really even in the interior of the, of the park. When I used to guide, I used to actually drink water from some of those northern interior lakes, literally right out of the middle of the lake. Now, there's always a little bit of a risk with that. Um, and, and part of whether you'll be able to digest it or how well you do may actually um, have something to do with where your, your gut health is at the time, too. Uh, but beyond that, and what the, the general recommended one for wilderness is, is really just bring the water to a boil. So as soon as the water hits the roiling boil, you see those bubbles, uh, then it's safe to drink. That's fairly labor intensive though. So a lot of us end up bringing mechanical filters. Um, you know, so those are, you can bring, you can kill bacteria and by boiling it, you can also kill it by running through a mechanical filter. And there's multiple different versions of that. Um, when my wife and I went to the Yukon this last year, the ones that we brought in on our tomogamy tick, we actually got some filters from Scott. They're called the Berkey Sports. And they're literally these like water bottles that you can just dip into the lake and, and it's like a straw coming out of it. Oh yeah, Scott's got them right there and you can squeeze it. And those take out bacteria and do they do viruses as well, Scott? Uh, no, these do no. not do the, the, the main, the big countertop stainless steel units do viruses, but these, these will do bacteria. These will do basically everything the countertop unit does except viruses. So this will do the bacteria, parasites, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, the pharmaceuticals, even gas and oil. So if you're traveling through cottage country and there's, you know, gas and oil sheen on the water, this will even remove those as well. Yeah, awesome. So there's, there's a bunch of different mechanical filters. I've used the Berkey one there that Scott has, and I've used a couple other different models over the years. So if, Laura, that's kind of my question there. Uh, anything you want to add to that conversation or are you kind of similar there, Scott, with the three things I mentioned? Yeah, definitely similar. I mean, yeah, I've been canoe tripping since I was eight. So that was 1988. Um, the, that was uh, back then we would just use iodine drops or bleach drops, like five drops in a liter bottle, shake it, let it sit for an hour. That would kill everything. Of course, long term, you don't want to be drinking iodine and bleach daily for too long. And then we got into those pump filters. But those are, yeah, you're pumping forever. And it's, uh, they, they're kind of frustrating. They take a long time. Um, and then there, now there's yeah, gravity bags you can hang off the tree. Um, I think like cat, catadin and, and maybe platypus do some of those. Um, but those are really just removing the bacteria and parasites, nothing else. 
So now that I, since I've discovered the sport Berkey bottle, it's just so easy. You just, you know, you just scoop the water and it, and squeeze the bottle and suck from the straw and it filters as you drink and it's removing hundreds of contaminants, like a lot of things we just, we just spoke about. Um, my sister has a couple daughters and they do a ton of canoe tripping and they used to always do those, those pump filters, which like, you know, they take for, to fill a liter bottle takes like five minutes. It's really it's crazy. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it's packed away. You don't want to break it out and pump. So everyone's kind of getting thirsty and dehydrated and grumpy, um, on the, through the daily canoe trip. So, so they started, they did a trip with these bottles and it was just so great because my, my nieces were, it was like an experiment, like, Hey, let's drink this waterfall. Let's drink this puddle. And it was just so easy. And they were drinking more, they were staying more hydrated, which led to just more, you know, joy and, and peace through the trip. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, there's some good questions coming through here. I'm just checking out through here. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody there, I can't pronounce the name there, but they, they just mentioned uh, getting a, a, a parasite in tomogamy. I actually got Dardia in tomogamy as well. Uh, it's not something you want to mess with. So if you do come off a canoe trip and you start having belly issues, uh, it was suggested there, get to a doctor right away. So I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm giving a thumbs up to that comment that was made down there. I've given my like, um, yeah, definitely not something to mess around with. Um, yeah. One thing I love about the, the filters with the Berkey as well, too, um, not, not necessarily, yeah, um, meaning to do like a big plug here for Berkey or anything, but um, in, from an emergency disaster preparedness perspective, I, when I first started teaching emergency and disaster, more like urban survival, uh, one of the scariest situations in an urban setting is, you know, what if all the water becomes contaminated with chemicals and, and things of that nature? Um, suddenly we can't just boil it, you know, uh, that becomes a real problem. So the Berkey system suddenly become a, a system where, you know, I, I don't know if there was like a massive flood, if I'd want to be taking water off the streets and, and running it through a Berkey, but I would certainly collect the water off of my roof. Um, you know, even with the little shingle particles and stuff coming off of it and, and throw it through the Berkey there, you know, uh, I could go to that urban park and potentially scoop up that water and put it through there, you know, uh, where it might be yep. a smaller amount of, of contamination. I mean, the scary part about chemicals is we never really know how much is in there and what's in there. Um, but I do feel like Berkey is, uh, they do give us this like extra peace of mind. So my wife and I, we actually are on well water. Um, and we got one a number of years ago and I originally bought it or, or got it wanting it for emergencies and disasters. So uh, I'm a huge advocate of having some sort of water purification system in your home in case you ever end up in a scenario, you know, whether it's like the flooding we've seen down in Texas or the hurricane or, you know, there's a, there's a million different things that could cause municipal water to be contaminated or uh, stop your access. You know, a massive um, infrastructure disaster that <coughs> knocks up a part of the grid for a while and the water just stops flowing. So whether you live in the city or the country, I really recommend as part of your self-reliance, like probably one of your first steps would be to come up with some sort of figure out how would you get water if it stops coming out of your tap or uh, you can't drink that water coming out of your tap because it's contaminated. Um, so we bought a Berkey system with uh, that being our, um, our plan, but then we realized our water is actually uh, has really high iron in it and really high tannins in it. So we didn't used to drink our water from the house. We'd actually go to a well up the road and fill it up. And we started running our water through the Berkey. And now it's like, oh, great. We can actually drink our tap water now. Um, yeah. And I'd say if I lived in the city, I would definitely do the same thing. Like uh, I'm not a big fan of buying plastic bottles for water to drink out of. Uh, I think there's many environmental problems with that. Um, so, but if I lived in the city, I would be, I would have a Berkey on my table and be running water through it or some sort of similar system there. Um, any other thoughts just on kind of water in the context of emergencies and disasters, Scott? Um, I mean, I, like, yeah, I, I, everything I'm feeling is, is with the breaking filters. I mean, I got sick twice from, 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 from Jardia. Um, I started, I didn't even know about Berkey's. They weren't on my radar. I started researching, you know, what is the best water filter? Um, Berkey kept coming up over and over for me. And I really, the things that really checked my boxes was A, it's a health and wellness tool. B, it's an emergency preparedness tool. C, the filters last on average five years. So you're not consistently like throwing filters away. They don't require electricity or water pressure. Um, so it checked all my boxes. I bought one. It was amazing. The water tasted great. And uh, family and friends were like, what is this thing? I've never seen one before. And the water tastes so great. And then they're like, what? The filters last five years? You know, it was just, uh, it, it was, it just really spoke to my heart of like, this is the solution. And, um, and it has been, and I'm really, 
really happy to be offering them to people now across Canada. Um, with a, with emergencies, I mean, yeah, I mean, if if you can't, if you don't have a Berkey, then yeah, definitely you're going to want to be able to collect your rainwater. You're going to want to be able to boil it. Uh, you're going to want to have maybe some iodine on hand or those, you know, those aqua tabs. There's so many different solutions out there. But for an everyday kind of solution and, and the most economical, powerful solution, I know nothing better than the Berkey. And I actually have on my website, like, if you know anything better than this, please tell me because I, I want to know. And nobody has, I've, I've heard nothing better. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. There's a few people in the crowd that are saying they have Berkey's as well. Um, yeah. I, and I really think, you know, in that emergent disaster, if you don't have the Berkey, then, then I would support um, the idea of, you know, you ideally you're collecting rainwater, you know, if it's raining, um, you're boiling it, you're running it through some sort of sediment filter. Um, there's lots of info out there on kind of like survival water harvesting. Um, so there's, there's some, some things to maybe look on, put on your homework list to, to think about, you know, how else could you harvest water in an urban setting? Uh, I'm noticing the time here. I'd like to us to wrap up fairly shortly here. And I have one more okay. topic I'd like to get in here, Scott, which is around the idea of, of stewardship and caretaking water. So it's one thing to have water polluted by an emergency or disaster, but we're also having issues with, with human um, produced uh, issues uh, of damaging our water systems. Um, so I'd like to chat with you about that a little bit. I'm also noticing a couple questions we could probably rock off really quick. Um, sure. One of them here is someone's just saying, what about life straws? Um, so I can just share, I, I've used life straws before. They work great. The one thing with life straws is I find they're a bit of work. Like you have to really suck on them and I find they get gummed up fairly quick. So I think they're, they're, they're totally a valid solution. I actually have a life straw in my emergency kit because it's so small and compact. So that's what I like about the life straw. What I don't like is I find it's kind of a lot of work and a pain to suck versus like something like the Berkey Sport where you can squeeze it and literally get just like a big mouthful of water. Um, so that's a thought on life straws. Um, Janice says, does Berkey's deal with chlorine? My understanding is yes, they do, right? Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. To like beyond 99.999% removal. Yeah. Um, and I thought I saw another question from. I saw something. Do we, do you sell to the U S and um, I, uh, I can. Yeah. So if, if you're in the U S and you want a Berkey, then please call or email me. I can help you. My, I generally sell only within Canada and my, my checkout page is set up for that, but I do make exceptions. So, uh, if you're in the U S and want a Berkey, then yeah, call or email me and I can help you. Great. So, so Laura is taking over the role of uh, host and moderator there. She's got a great segue question for us though. So I'm just going to read it. Awesome. Um, so in regards to being conscious about water, what actions can citizens take to advocate for protecting for our waterways? Where does one start? And I know you're involved with a couple of organizations here in Canada um, that do some great work around uh, both restoring and, of ecosystems. Um, and, and one of the things that's been on my mind a lot, you know, I remember a number of years ago, the Canadian government, uh, when Justin Trudeau came in, made this big promise. Um, I forget the percentage, and you might know this, but a huge number of our Northern First Nations communities are still under boil water advisory. A lot of them have like mercury and toxic elements in their water. Um, and it's not something that they did wrong. It's from dams. It's from, uh, from development issues up there. Um, and the Canadian government has been promising for years to come in and help and hasn't been. So I know you've also got some experience uh, with some organizations that are working to to make sure that um, First Nations communities and people around the country have access to clean water. So there, there's kind of a multi-part question there, Scott. Um, next steps for people that care about water, um, that want to help, and then maybe some thoughts on on that topic of, of water in First Nations communities in Canada. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so yeah, the Trudeau government, they, they did, they had a goal of ending boil water advisories by 2021. It didn't happen. They did end some of the advisories. Um, it's, it's to me, it's just, yeah, absurd and, 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 and disgusting and just really terrible, obviously that there's so many, there's about, I think about 50 First Nations reserves across Canada that are still on boil water advisories and have been for something like 20 years or more. Um, you can you can look that up and see the exact numbers, but it's approximately that. Um, so I have since I started Conscious Water, I've always been giving back um, in different ways. I donate to uh, the Blue Mountain Watershed Trust, which is a local organization protecting local watersheds, Environmental Defense Canada, I've been donating to for about seven or eight years now. And then I've been in touch. I have First Nations people who are 
buying Berkeys from me. And then they're saying, you know, can you help out and donate some? And I have, um, and, and through Elephant Thoughts, which is a local organization, and they work with First Nations people, they integrated the Berkey water filters into some of their educational programs. So they were donated and then taught how to set them up and maintain them. So that was great. But there was always, there's always just been a little bit of a disconnect and I haven't heard, um, you know, how things are going and then I wanted to have more of an impact. So uh, luckily I came across Water First about three years ago. They're in Creemore, which is only about 30 minutes south here of Collingwood. And they're the largest, most active nonprofit organization in Canada, helping First Nations on boil water advisories. Um, so they, they also, they address water issues through education, collaboration, and training. They have internships. They're not only helping on boil water advisories, they're also helping with, uh, for example, rehabilitation of, of streams and fish habitat. Um, so that they, they're doing amazing things. And they're one of their huge things that they do, they spend literally years working with First Nations people and building, building trust and um, making sure they're coming in with the right attitude and there's there's unity happening and mutual respect um so they're the best organization i can think of and and they really resonated with me i went i went to their office i met the founder we had an hour chat with him and some of his staff and i've been donating to them manually for three years so every with every Berkey purchase some of that money goes goes towards water first um and what they're doing so if anybody's worried or if i mean if anybody wants to contribute in a meaningful way, I definitely recommend go to their website. It's waterfirst.ngo. They're also on Instagram and Facebook. You can call them and chat. And in my opinion, they're doing the, the best work in Canada right now. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. I'm also just noticing Roberta posted another link there called the Great Lakes Trust and their missions to bring the Great Lakes water, uh, sorry, the missions for all Great Lakes water to be swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. So there's another organization yeah. that, that Roberta just shared there. Uh, another one I'll yeah. just throw out there. You know, this was kind of on the theme of what we were discussing about last week with our guest Sunshine. Um, and she was sharing about, um, so she's down in uh, South Dakota, uh, living on the Dakota Reserve there. Um, and she was talking about how a lot of their watersheds have been damaged by hydro dams. And, and um, basically it's taken water out of the system and these big rivers have come down to these tiny little creeks and the land was damaged. So they're actually engaging in restoration projects along the shores of these waters uh, to bring back natural habitat. Um, so on a local level, that would be another thing to think about getting involved in. You know, if you, I would, I, for myself, I would say, you know, step one on a local level is one, just know what, what your watershed is, you know, know where all the creeks are and know yeah. where the headwaters are, know where they're coming from. And then look at what, what does the shoreline look like that entire way? from where that water comes out of the ground down to the uh, down to where it hits the big lake. And are there projects that are either going on or projects that you could even start um, to start uh, restoring natural habitat. And we call it like um, kind of buffers along the edge of it, you know, uh, even, you know, a 10, 10 meters of trees and plants and shrubs on the edge of that river or the edge of that lake can make a world of difference in the water ecology um, and, and is really helpful for the, the fish, the ducks, the birds, really everything there. Uh, so I think land restoration, uh, we call it riparian zones along the edges of water bodies is a huge thing uh, you could think about uh, getting involved in and enacting on a local level there. So that would be the one piece that I'd add to, uh, to Scott's conversation there. Um, Scott, I think it, it's, we're hitting our 930 mark there. So I'd like to wrap us up. Um, so anything you would like to close out with for kind of final thoughts? And then I think people kind of already know, Sherry Ann, maybe I'll ask you just to throw up the links to Scott's site again there. So a Scott to his website. Oh, there's also a link. Um, Scott was on another podcast interview uh, not too long ago talking about water and he's doing a contest to give away a big Berkey water filter. Um, so I think Sherry Ann's got a link that she can share for that. Um, so yeah, Sherry Ann, if you can put this, eh, his website, his Instagram, and then that, that other project uh, in the chat, that would be great. Um, yeah, anything else you want to close out with though, Scott? Um, just thank you, Chris. Yeah, I'm really grateful and happy to be here. And one, one question you ask, did ask me is like, what are your, your lessons from water? And, you know, do you have any takeaways, you know, in your experiences traveling, uh, and sailing, surfing, canoeing, for example, how, do the, how does that translate into, into self-reliance? Um, and I would say, yeah, some... So, 
it, it, it's really taught me my, uh, my, my place in the world. You know, water is in charge, mother nature is in charge, and we need to always approach with caution, with reverence, with respect. And, um, and you know, the water can teach us and, and, and don't push the river. <laughs> That's a huge one, I would say. You know, you're sometimes you're in challenges. Life is hard, and and like don't don't swim upstream. Don't fight it. You know, um, go with the river and uh, approach with reverence and respect. There's so many lessons we can learn from water. I I love and recommend everybody. You know, spend time with the water as much as you can. Sit on the coast, walk by the river, soak it up, and there's the lessons will come to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Scott. You know, there's one, one question here to finish us off too. Someone, uh, Gus just asked, so there's these mineral stones that you can add to your water. I believe it kind of realkalizes the water and adds minerals to it. And he's asking, uh, is it good to be boiling the mineral stones every three months for the Berkey? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I, uh, yeah, you need to boil them every three months to sterilize them. And the, the main goal of those stones is to raise the pH of the water, which helps to alkalize it, which helps to alkalize our body for greater immune system strength. That's a whole other conversation, um, which I'm happy to have another time. And I have a lot of information on my website about that. But yeah, I do offer those stones and a, a lot of naturopathic doctors and nutritionists and myself and a lot of about half my customers do add those stones to their Berkey's for, for greater health and better water. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having us, Scott. This has truly been a pleasure. Thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, we have another Thank call next that. week. We have Brandy Gallagher coming from Our Eco Village. Um, and we're going to be doing these calls weekly, basically until um, kind of the end of May. So hopefully you'll come to future ones. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing the word. I would love to grow these and, and get, uh, I'd love to have twice the number of people on here. So if you know people interested, please help us share the word. Otherwise, uh, have a great night, everybody. Uh, keep tracking. Um, yeah, keep paying attention to nature and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you, brother. Good night.